into the making of this. So uh, it's a very uh, great time. So uh, welcome to everyone. Um, if you're not supposed to be in the multimodal machine learning course, then uh, you're in the wrong room. This is uh, 11777. Uh, we have a great team uh, of both instructors and TAs. Um, so uh, Paul, uh, who will be co-lecturing this course uh, with me, uh, was one of the uh, co-author on this new multimodal survey paper that we'll uh, share with you in a little bit. Um, so we will be co-lecturing this uh, course, and we have a team of about five TAs who are going to be there to help you, especially with the course project, which is a big component of this class. Um, so you're in a multimodal course. Um, I would like first to find out who is in the audience. Uh, usually when we take a multimodal course, it's because we have at least one modality with which we're more uh, expert. Um, so I'd like to know in the, uh, uh, the course roster right now, who, if you had to pick one modality, which modality would you say either you like better or you're more of an expert? So uh, who is uh, more about language? Language, okay. Do we have also computer vision? Vision, oh good, okay. We have a good fight, language vision. That's good, as speech, signal processing. Great, thank you. <laughs> uh, any uh, medical imaging, medical? Yes, great. Uh, cognitive science, yeah. Um, mobile phone, HCI maybe. Um, any other modalities that I have not um, discussed? Okay, so language and vision will definitely be a big part of the course today, uh, this semester, but a lot of what we will discuss is uh, generalizable to other modalities as well. And that's why we designed the course that way. The course is not called language and vision for that purpose. So um, you're in multimodal course. Um, what is multimodal? That's like, we should at least define that. And so what is multimodal? We, we, we see a lot of multimodal technologies coming out more and more, uh, or at least promises of multimodal technology. Uh, we start, or uh, we've seen over the years, uh, robots slightly coming out, and then in the uh, industry, mobile phone has been a very good multimodal sensor. Uh, we start seeing vehicle, event uh, cars, self-driving cars, and uh, in their house with these uh, uh, speaker phone assistant, uh, and we see a lot of progress eventually in augmented reality. In fact, we spent also the last two years, uh, and I'm really glad to see all of you in person this time, uh, but we did spend a lot of time on those online uh, technologies, um, which also uh, evolve a little bit, quite a bit, in fact, uh, are not perfect, but evolve quite a bit. I, I mentioned the co-instructor, so Paul, <laughs> Paul is the co-instructor of the course, and I forgot to mention, uh, we have two of the TAs here present. So Alex and Partik are both here. And so just to earlier the presentation. So what is multimodal? When we think of multimodal, we often think of the modalities that are present in, um, in human. So human modalities or human communication modalities are often the ones so a lot of it is often about the way we express ourselves and also so the language, the, the choice of words, the sentence, or even the intent behind those sentences, the right at the, which is uh, closer to sorry, pragmatic. But also it's how you say these words and the vocal expression, the postular, the laughter. I have a little background more. I, I should not disclose that, but I'm originally from computer vision. Uh, I'm in an NLP department, so don't go tell them, uh, but uh, I've definitely started. There's also a lot on the visual side. Here I'm, I'm, I'm showing the visual signals and behaviors that are more human-centric, but it's a lot also about object recognition, event recognition. And then as we've discussed, it goes way beyond that, both for human, but also we start seeing those uh, cell phone and other sensors coming up. So there's a lot of these modalities. So what is a modality? 
the definition that we will use here is a modality. It refers to a way in which something is expressed or perceived. And we will look at both. A lot of the research is often more on the perception side. How do you integrate modalities to come together? But there's a lot of interest in also uh, expressing, although it comes with uh, some issues like ethical issues uh, as well when you start generating models. And when, I, and when we talk about modality, there's always this question like, is this data a modality? Like, uh, I have this data, is this, are these two uh, really two different modalities? Or are they all part of the same modality? So to help us with this, we will create and talk about raw modality and abstracted modality. So raw modality is very close to the sensor. So it can be like a signal coming from the microphone, an image from a camera, for example. So some example will be a speech signal directly from the microphone. And then you can go and start having abstracted, like process modalities, abstracted. And language is definitely one of them. It's very rare that you just get language. It's either you get it visually, it has been written, uh, or you get it through the speech, a spoken language. And then other, like when you think even more abstracted, you think of maybe even like sentiment, emotion label, you can call them um, uh, modalities. And for the purpose of this course, we will call them modalities, but I will show you in a second that these, when I, by default, when I talk of modality, this is usually what people will or maybe these will be what the raw modalities. And a lot of the course, you gain the most from this course around here, but here you can still use them as modalities. There's nothing that stops you. And, and as you discussed earlier, they, they're just, uh, in a sense, uh, slightly, there's less differences here, and there's a lot more differences there. So multimodal, the definition, the first, the dictionary definition, multimodal is multiple modality. That's simple. But let me share uh, what we think is a nice research-oriented uh, definition. Multimodal is the study, or the science, the study of heterogeneous and interconnected data. And I'm going to define those two terms, because these are going to be central to this whole course. But heterogeneous and interconnected modality. Let's start with the first one, heterogeneous. So heterogeneous means that there's information present in different modalities, which often show different qualities, different structure, different representations. In fact, if you think of heterogeneous, there's also a spectrum of it. Like on one side, there's like more homogeneous modalities. Um, and uh, so example of homogeneous, two images of two cameras, or two images of the same camera, that's even more homogeneous. The homogeneous is two images of two different cameras. Uh, there's a little bit different, different view angle, but definitely a lot of the structure of the data, a lot of the noise will see different, similar. And then text maybe from two different languages, uh, especially if the alphabet is different, language and vision. And then you can imagine, I can continue on, on what it is even more heterogeneous. And just to come back with earlier the statement, so we talk about raw modalities and abstract modalities. As you can expect, usually raw modalities are a lot more heterogeneous in nature and more abstracted modalities. When you start abstracting, often you end up with representations that are very simplistic or a lot simpler, maybe just numbers, like is it emotion or not? Is there an intensity of emotion or not? And so at that point, the data is a lot more homogeneous. And usually when we, at least for the multimodal machine learning, a lot of what we'll discuss is the most helpful when we start looking at the more heterogeneous cases. So this is why homogeneous. And so let me share, how can two modalities be heterogeneous and share some example of how it is. And for that, let's use language and vision, because these are two modalities that we have uh, heard about and we've seen a lot of great progress. So if you have an image of a teacup on the right 
Uh, so you have an image and you have a caption associated with it. So a teacup on the right of a laptop in the clean room. So these modalities are different. And what, how do we characterize those differences? Let me share some taxonomy or some ways of seeing these heterogeneity. At the first level, the elements, what considers an element in a modality? And here, as you will see also over the lectures in the coming weeks, um, the community research community has kind of uh, accepted that images are almost of a list of objects. It's an approximation of what an image is, but you could imagine it as one representation of an image, a list of objects. And then we have words. And so then on one side, you have these objects that are maybe represented locally by these bounding box or some representation over these region of interest. And then on the other side, a lot more discrete tokenized representation. So at the raw level, these are quite different. As we will see, the research community has built tricks to take those very heterogeneous ones and brought them in a lot more closer space, homogeneous, and then did a lot of the fusion at that. And that's where we'll talk basic fusion as an example for that. A second aspect is that these modalities have a different way, a different distribution of those, those elements. And so some of them may have very close frequency, very dense uh, information encoded there. Um, and these elements have a structure. So an image will have a spatial structure. A sentence will often have, in fact, sentence will have a sequential structure. But I want to bring another term for you, uh, which is the structure that you see. And there is the latent structure as well. So the structure that you see for sentences is more linear. But as we know, for many people, who, uh, definitely for people studying NLP, uh, know is that language has a lot of hidden structure to it. So that's why it's not everything to see and visualize the, the observable structure, you also need to uh, take into consideration the latent structure as well. The amount of information and abstraction in your data. In fact, an image could be seen at the pixel level, could be seen like edges, could be seen a part of object, object, aggregation of object. There's a lot of ways. So the way the amount of information inside an element, and as you imagine, Elements doesn't need to be only one type of element. So an image could be both represented by its edges and the objects if, if it is important for this problem. Finally, one, no, there's two more. One is noise, and you underestimate that, but noise is extremely important. Like, for example, images, there could be some, uh, 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 there could be some occlusion or some noise. People working in speech and signal processing know this very well. There's a lot of, in fact, fMRI, uh, um, EEG is another example. Um, that these really needs uh, to take into consideration that noise if you're not careful. So this is one of the things that you would take into consideration. And in the, it could be also typos in the writing as well. And finally, the relevance to the task. How much is data really relevant if I have a specific task in mind? So this is heterogeneity. So the data has a data with modalities that are heterogeneous. But if it was just that, it would be two different modalities, heterogeneous. But if they're not somewhat connected, then you lose the, the power of multimodal. Because if there's no connection, if there's no way to synchronize the data, to align the data, if they're really completely separate, then it becomes very hard. So this is why multimodal will have a huge component in it in aligning our data. And so what are the connection between the modalities? And also, and that's, that's a concept that it may take a few minutes, hours or lectures to pick up, but there is the concept of multimodal interaction. And I wanna clarify that when you have two modalities, I have two modalities right now. You have language and vision. By themselves, you can study 
the commonalities between it. But if you want to study the interaction, then you need to have some kind of inference, some kind of recognition. Like, like if there is no integration of the data and the modalities are just there, then there is not interaction. So interaction only comes when you do something with the data. When you start doing something with the data, you run it through a neural network to get an output. At that moment, you start seeing interaction. Interaction could be also because you, you, you translate from one modality to another. That's another type of inference. But as if you don't do anything with the data, the data is just sitting there. So the question I often get, can I pick up interactions just from unsupervised data? And the answer is most likely not. There are tricks to do it in a self-supervised way, but generally you can study commonalities with unsupervised, but for the, for the case where you want to really study how the data fuses, integrate to each other, you need usually either some kind of task, some kind of inference. We'll discuss more over the coming weeks, but I just want to give you this initial one. So what are the connections? Why would two elements of two modalities be connected with each other? And there's at least two right general direction for that. One is because the elements of one modality, these objects, and elements from these other modalities, let's say the words, that they are corresponding to each other. They are equivalent to each other. They are like the same, okay? So that, that is something you can do. And you can do it in two ways. You can look at it in a statistical way, kind of data-driven, kind of bottom-up, or you can look at it in a more semantic way, kind of more top-down human knowledge. So statistically, you could say things like elements that co-occur are probably related to each other. If something co-occur or in statistical sense, like correlate, co-occur or correlate, they are probably related to each other. And that's called in statistic association. So you're associating these two variables are associated. In a more semantic or a more like top down, like if you have human knowledge and you could have either through annotation or some other process, you may identify the correspondence between them by annotating data or some other means. But the idea here is that it's not just because two object co-occur, but it's like their meaning, semantic being their meaning or their nature uh, are uh, corresponding to each other. So that's the, the, the bottom up kind of statistical and the semantic. And in a sense, these two are both looking at correspondences, uh, <laughs> at correspondences and association, but they're looking at a different perspective. One is just because two elements are co-occurring, they are equivalent or similar or uh, uh, corresponding, and they are, it's because of human. But there is also sometimes connection, not because they're exactly the same, but they're related in some fashion. There's some relationship that this cup is clean. It's a clean cup. Although we're talking about here the clean room, but maybe the room is clean because the cup is clean. That's possibly. And why do they think it's a room? I mean, the couch tells you that it's a room, so it's the couch in the room. So these are relationships. So you can have either statistically or semantically, the, the most uh, intuitive one is, would be semantically, where, where it's not that the word and that object just correspond to each other, but, but there's an attribute, there's a relation between them. And they should be connected because of that uh, relationship. And in statistical sense, it could be because one uh, uh, event always happened before another one, or if you have a little bit of, um, uh, if you do some uh, intervention on it, you can maybe even look at causality uh, as an aspect of it, or at least, so the correlation is definitely the easiest, uh, don't need any extra knowledge. When you start looking at dependencies, you, you need to start studying, so there's a little bit of extra knowledge in here, because how do you do intervention to confirm that there's causality? But this is 
this is but this is very interesting so the dependency has a little bit of a relationship related to the relationship so but this is more data driven um this is really there's some human knowledge that says hey this object is related in this world and that's the kind of relationship or attribute between them and this you can do either unsupervised like differently in the set to because this can be done uh, and we'll see some of these approaches. Uh, it can be done also in supervised because you gain maybe some data, someone annotated the relationships or annotated the correspondence. And, and, and one field very popular is uh, language grounding, trying to have a better representation of my language by looking at how it relates to the other modalities, usually with visual. And so you could have annotations related to that. So these are connections, but then there is interactions. So how are modality interacting with each other? You bring them together and now they start to interact with each other. And so the modality here, you want to ask yourself, how do I categorize all the type of multimodal interaction there exists? One approach is forget the details of how the interaction is happening. And let's just look at the output. So there's the input and the output. Let's just look at the output for a second and use that as a way to categorize how modalities are interacting with each other. And so if you look at the same example here, a teacup uh, on the right of the laptop and the image, but by themselves, there's no interaction. But if I start asking you maybe a question, is this indoor? I, I can look at it in a unimodal way. This probably look indoor. I pick up on the right of a laptop in a clean room. This is probably also indoor. So this is called unimodal redundancy. What does it mean? Is both modalities are giving me the same response when I look at them from a unimodal way. That's unimodal redundancy. But if I do it in a multimodal way, the answer is also yes. So there we, ha we have the, the process, we have the, um, um, the concept of what's called multimodal enhancement. So both modalities give me an answer that are quite similar in the same direction. And if I fuse them together, they enhance each other. They add to each other. This is in, in contrast, which I bring these two, which are going in the same direction. And when I choose them, they don't enhance, they don't change, they don't increase, or they don't decrease. We would call this equivalent. But here, I have two modalities, they go in the same direction. And then you ask yourself, what is the multimodal interaction that could happen? Is either the increase or the decrease. Now, this is the, I would say, the simpler case. The more interesting one is when both modalities give me different information. So each modality, so maybe I add, is this a living room? Yes, from the uh, image, but just from this clean room, a laptop. You see, a laptop is not in the living room, at least it was not uh, before Zoom. So, um, but yeah, a tea cup on the right of a laptop. So it could be probably in the study room. So there's different information in both of them. So we will call it unimodal non-redundancy. Both modalities have something different to bring to the table. They bring something different. And there, then there's like, how is the integration going to happen in this case? And so the integration here could be, and there were a different type of it, but one of it could be dominant. One of the modality just takes over the other modality. It's just too relevant for the task. It takes over this. And in fact, it was this wonderful work. So we, sometimes we're like, oh, we're doing multimodal machine learning. We're the new people of doing this. Nobody ever thought about it. And then you look at it and in cognitive science, behavioral science, looking not at computers or at computer scientists, but looking at how human and animals are communicating. It's a wonderful, there's an initial paper and a follow-up journal paper with an amazing appendix of different multimodal, uh, they call it multi-sensory uh, integration. 
And they suggested a taxonomy that is quite relevant to us. And so the taxonomy for them, they're, they're looking at it as there's two signals, like two modalities, two signals. And how would the receiver, so it's a communication, how is the person receiving those signals will interpret them? Well, how would they integrate the information in their brain and interpret them? And they suggested this taxonomy. The first level is the one we just discussed. It's like, are these two modalities bringing something new to the table? Are they redundant? Or are they non-redundant? And then if they are redundant, then in this case, then the only two they suggested is either the equivalent, they don't bring anything, like there's just no, in a sense, integration, or there's an enhancement. The non-redundant is the more interesting. Here, you could have independence. Both modality, you integrate them, they just don't fuse. They just you get at the end, you get an apple and an orange, you get you fuse them, you still get an apple and an orange at the end. Another option is dominance that we just discussed. One modality just takes over the other modality. And then modulation is really interesting. How one mod, mod one uh, modality will in fact affect the other modality, will maybe enhance it or reduce it, will sign kind of change. So there's come a kind of a transfer of knowledge from one modality to another. Modulation is one term. In this course, we'll call it transferring. And then the holy grail. Oh, it's emergence. Something comes out that never like was not part of either of them. That's the holy grail of multimodal fusion machine learning. We always look for that something that's like really like it's you could say it's a nonlinear intra interaction uh, between them, but it's something that's not involved. And really, you need to bring them together to come out uh, this. So this is really useful. And in fact, when we start studying interaction, this is in during the inference as as a taxonomy for multimodal machine learning. We will use as a first uh, step. We will use this same kind of taxonomy to study the response study. So it's kind of, we will call it the kind of more black box way of uh, studying uh, interaction. And it makes sense for human, uh, for this behavioral science, because at least in 2005, uh, not as easy to study the brain with a lot of detail. Now we have a lot better imaging. And so a lot of follow-up comes out, but then there's the question of like, how do you study? But we're computer scientists, and we do have access to the inside the brain of our algorithm. And so we will go on a step further and really try to understand the interaction mechanics, the dynamics, how are modalities interacting with each other? Are they additive, multiplicative, nonlinear, causal, logical? All of these different ways, modalities. And also one other aspect is the modalities, because even if you have four modalities, they may not all interact with each other, or they may interact in different way with each other. So there may be just bimodal interaction, although you have four modalities as input, there may be only two. And finally, the magic word of context, really understanding these interaction uh, within the context. And context could be the structure of the data. It could be the temporal structure, like the past and the future, uh, all of these context information. So that's what we'll talk about this semester. Multimodal, the science of heterogeneous and interconnected data. That's, that's the focus on, on this. So um, what is multimodal machine learning? So this was multimodal. Multimodal machine learning will use a simple uh, uh, definition, which is mostly from the machine learning, the study of computer algorithms that learn and improve through the use and experience of data from multiple modalities. This is the more dictionary version of it. I just want to make a quick uh, clarification. Is multimodal machine learning the same as multimodal AI? Yes, maybe. Okay, so multimodal AI, really, if we look at how it was originally defined, AI is computer agent that demonstrate intelligence capabilities such as understanding, reasoning, and planning to the multimodal experience. So multimodal 
AI is a superset of multimodal machine learning. This is how it was meant. Now, in the uh, in the newspapers and even even in some people's research uh, papers, you interlace, you see them as the same. But AI was really meant as an agent interacting, planning. There's a lot of other aspects, machine learning about the learning aspect of it and generalization and all that goes with this. So we will focus on that, but as things evolve over the years, I mean, there's, there's definitely an overlap in between that and some of it at the end, specifically the last few lectures will start about embodied AI, robots and navigation. There's a lot of very interesting there. So multimodal machine learning, with at least three modalities. Let's say you have language, vision, and acoustics. And here's the decision we made for almost all of the lectures. This is one of the few times you're gonna see the name of a modality. Most of the time, we will go this way. To, to just emphasize that modalities, are, it's not, the approaches, are not, we're trying to show approaches that are not specific to one modality or another. Doesn't mean we will not show example, come back to language or come back to acoustic. Uh, we will come back to them. But in general, the core of it should be, uh, and right now I show them just for simplicity. I show them as temporal, like sequential, just for simplicity. But as we will see, modalities can have different structure. An image is not the sequence. Uh, it's really a more 2D or 3D spatial. So there's a lot of information. So just for simplicity, we will keep them in that format for most of these, but just as a generalization. Uh, so the multimodal machine learning is this concept of learning, of understanding, of perceiving information from one or multiple modality in such a way that you output a representation that would be more like multimodal representation learning, or maybe um, you try to do a prediction task, or I didn't play it sure there, you could generate another modality as the output. So all of three of them are, are together. I just want to also make a clarification here. I will, I will on purpose, not overemphasize like, oh, is this approach uh, supervised approach or unsupervised or self-supervised or even reinforcement learning? Because a lot of the core question in multimodal are about integration of heterogeneous and, and, and aligning these interconnected modalities. So the fact that there is a label or not, the fact that you created instead a self-supervised task to really uh, bring this extra supervision or the fact that you're trying to understand the data through some kind of clustering. All of these usually, not always, usually have little impact on the fact that it is multimodal. So we will, I will not re-emphasize this. I mean, it would have been easy to structure the course like this is unsupervised, this is supervised, this is reinforcement learning. But these labels, although really important for the machine learning in general, for the core multimodal machine learning, we will we will bring them some time. Like for example, self-supervised. There is a lot of nice parallel with um, data augmentation, where the different views of the augmentation could be as mod seen as modalities, for example. So we will make those uh, links, but we will not overemphasize a lot of the approach we will present are in fact generalizable for a lot of these learning uh, schema. Uh, when we talk about reinforcement, we will talk a little bit about it, but again, it's not just about like the cue learning, but it's more about something about the way you integrate information in your say, for example. So um, here's the, like, what was LP and his students doing the last year, uh, or part of it was even during the pandemic, was thinking about what are the core technical challenges in multimodal machine learning that are understudied. It doesn't mean they've never been studied in machine learning, but are somewhat understudied in conventional machine learning. So otherwise, will it, why would we have a full course on multimodal machine learning if it's just like, hey, this is the algorithm 
And now here's a new type of input. It's just a new input, but the rest is exactly the same. Um, so we tried, and, and, and that's what this course is trying to do is, in fact, when I first uh, joined back CMU, uh, I did the same exercise in 2015 for a year and a half and, and, and wrote at that point uh, a position survey paper on multimodal machine learning. If you have a problem falling asleep tonight, really great way to fall asleep. Uh, um, and it used to be also uh, reading a part of your reading assignment, that's the whole paper. Um, but, um, and also from there, uh, what, what grew the mature and multimodal machine learning course, in fact, even started back at USC. Um, and we, in fact, uh, have a course last spring that was really fun on multi advanced multimodal machine learning, much smaller, only 25 uh, or even 16 people. That was really a small group fun. Um, now we have the new version, um, and that's the one this course is going to be based on. We're revamping the course to go to those not five but six core challenges that, and it's not completely an overlap on each other. We'll sh share in a second. And and you are the guinea pigs. Uh, we're uh, uh, doing this brand new version with, with you. Um, so that we, we revamp. If you look at last year, the or even last spring, the the the, the syllabus, the, the 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 schedule is is very different. There is an overlap, probably the equivalent of about fifty percent overlap. The rest of it will bring new stuff. So. Um, so be patient with us. <laughs> if there's glitches in slides, uh, slides or anything like typos, uh, the first time we uh, did that. So, so what are the core challenges? There, there are six of them. The first one stays the same almost. Uh, is representation. It's, it's it's such a fundamental uh, aspect of multimodal. Is like learning representation that reflect those cross-modal interactions. That's what we talked earlier. How are those elements from two modalities interacting with each other? And here, this first challenge, we could have named it, and we're still debating how to name it. We could have named it multimodal local representation. Because here, because the, the problem is so big, like multimodal integration is so big, let's slice it. Let's go step by step. So local representation. What it means is look, and this is going to be a building block from almost all of the next uh, challenges. And so when we look at like choosing multimodal data, and multimodal of data often has some structure, either temporal or spatial. Let's look at this hard problem and let's simplify it for a second. And let's look two elements from two, one element from each modality. Let's start simpler. It, it's still a hard problem. And a lot of the core challenges come from that. And when you start having structured data, or a lot of it is just an extension of the core fundamental. So that's why it's learning representation that relates, reflects cross-modal interaction between individual elements across different modalities. So these could be because you have structured data and, and you can see this as some kind of local representation, local multimodal representation, or there are modalities that have been either summarized and really the feature are more holistic over everything. And so the structure has either been um, integrated over or average over or pooled, that's a cool way to call it these days. So, um, but you have this idea of two and um, uh, one element from each modality. How do you integrate and look at the representation? So that's local representation. And when you study local representation, there's at least three sub challenges fusion, coordination, and fission. Okay, for people who read the original uh, survey paper, fusion finally comes inside the representation. Um, so fusion is you have the number of input modalities is usually larger than the number of output representation. So that's fusion. So the integration of the more the cross modal interaction is explicit. This is this is where we're also going to discuss cross modal interaction with a lot more depth because that's a classic cross modal interaction coming together. Coordination is really interesting because here you have two elements, one from each modalities, 
And your goal is to learn a representation for each of them. You don't want like the number of modality and the number of representation stays the same, but you want to contextualize from each other. You, you, want, to, you want to learn, you want to bring some information from this in, into this uh, element and some uh, information from here into this representation. So it is uh, coordination. And, and this is, would be a precursor. I know you're like, hey, he's not yet said the word transformer. What is going on? Uh, am I, is it really machine learning? Uh, machine learning with no transformer doesn't exist. So, yeah, but it is a precursor uh, on that direction. So, uh, so I said it now, okay. <laughs> We can relax. Uh, so, okay, transformers, we'll discuss that. We have plenty of lectures on that. So, um, and then vision. A vision, we, 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 another name for it would have been factorized almost. Like, what are these elements? So, you want to integrate this information, but maybe there's more than one way these modalities are interacted with each other. And yet, you could say in transformer world, maybe multi headed, there's more than one way, but it could be that those factors are either uh, uh, um, they're overlapping or non overlapping. So there's a lot of interesting work uh, on this direction. And I, we personally believe that there's even more work to be done there. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. So uh, a lot of these uh, approaches will, um, like the, the typical approaches in that direction will be, uh, for example, clustering base. Um, so, so let's say that there is a way of fusing, but instead that space of the fuse, like let's say you have modality A, modality B, and you're looking at, at what is interacting between the two, instead of just saying that, there's just gonna be one space where all the possible interactions, I'm gonna say, hey, let me try to, as an easy thing, well, like, let me try to first, Pre cluster the data, and I'm going to learn three different spaces, one for each. I mean, the approaches are going to be more interesting than that, but the simplest one will be even before doing any fusion, why don't I try somehow to learn some clustering, maybe in my data, and then learn three separate uh, spaces? And there, why would one be more blue or red or something that there's no uh, external knowledge that uh, that goes? You, nothing stops you from saying I want one of them a lot more closer to another to a modality than another. But by default, these would be uh, just it, it will explore. It will try to find them for you. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, questions are good. I love questions. Um, so uh, the second one is alignment. And if you ask me what, what is the core of multimodal is, is that interconnected. So representation or local representation will be more about cross-modal interactions, finding what interact with. This is about finding the connection, what is connected with each other. So identifying and modeling, we will discuss that in a second, cross-modal connection between all elements of multiple modalities. And so uh, here, you, it's no more the local, but you really take into a consideration that each modality has a structure. So for an image, it could be like spatial, there's 2D. Uh, and as I told you, I will show always often the sequential just for simplicity, but you have to think that one model could be spatial. Uh, so nothing forced in all of these approaches almost uh, doesn't need to always. It could be hierarchical, it could be graph based. So, but there is some structure. So, I want to make the problem more interesting now. So, it's not just local representation. I have each modality has a structure in it. I want to take that into consideration. So the first sub challenge is to find the connections. What is connected to each other? And that can be a problem in itself. In fact, there is a subfield of uh, finding the links or the grounding, what object is grounded or linked to what words would be an example. Uh, also, you may have an example in computer vision, two videos, I'm trying to align them. Uh, I, I want to warp my video to each other. That's another example, maybe uh, aligning and connecting. The second one is 
uh, the bread and butter these days of machine a uh, model is I want to not do just the alignment or uh, finding those connections, but I also want to learn a new representation with this. And so you could call this contextualized representation. So it's no more about just learning uh, local representation. I want to learn representation that take into consideration the structure. So you call this structure representation, contextualized representation, or what's the word that we all love? Transformers. Uh -huh. So transformer would be in that. Often, an explicit alignment or goal is to find those unique, more like discrete set of connections. Often here, the alignment will be some kind of latent process. We don't really have labels that tells us this element is connected with which one. In fact, the extreme, which is seen in a lot of the self-attention approaches, will be uh, through those uh, fully connected. Every element from one modality fully connected to all elements of another modality will be the extreme version of that. And then one thing, and I know only if people uh, uh, put their hands up for medical imaging and speech and all this, but if there are many modalities where the characterization of an element is ambiguous. In speech, it's clear, um, um, uh, unless, unless your signal is for sure going to be a human speech, and maybe you can say there is maybe phoneme, and even that, there's challenges there, or you could say words. But like, how do you define an element? And even in images, as I mentioned, the research community accepted right now that images is a list of objects. But we know that it is an approximation of what an image can give you. And there's a lot of interesting extra information in an image that gets a little bit lost. So, um, so when we study these, these two, when we study these two, we should also take into consideration that there, for a good number of modalities, the definition of an element is not clear. Now, language is the exception. Like, there's been so much study on linguistic, and like, there is a really good understanding on the, what the elements do. Doesn't mean that they should be the only one. And even in linguistic, that you could reword, non phrase, sentence, like, there's, uh, there's, and you could start looking at it at the latent structure aspect, like the grammar. So, but yeah, think about it and remember that uh, challenge. So, the third challenge. Is, is no more just representation learning, but it's really about reasoning, which is combining the knowledge, usually through multiple step of entrance to exploit the multimodal alignment and the problem structure. Now, you will say, hey, my neural network has multiple layers, so I'm doing reasoning. Yeah, yes, it is. Let's call it reasoning. You have multiple steps, and it's true. Like for example, back in the days when in computer vision, uh, CNN convolutional neural network, um, there's been study that showed at least that the higher level seemed to be uh, modeling something that's a little bit closer to object parts, while the lower level more like something like Gaber filter, something closer to what like edges and 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 local. Uh, uh, textures will look like. So it's true that the reasoning can happen in those large uh, feed-forward neural networks. But a lot of time when people think of inference, of uh, reasoning, we also think of something that's in multiple steps, but these multiple steps have like intermediate representation that are a little bit more human interpretable. And human interpretable is a range. I mean, on one side is those dense representation of feed forward neural network. And yes, we have seen interesting thing like how our gradient can go. We can, um, uh, we can visualize the gradient and start understanding what is happening in the neural network. The, the different approaches to try to understand those representations. But there's also some attempt like to say, hey, I'm going to force them not to be dense as dense, but somewhat I will have some kind of a attention weights, uh, like on images or uh, on text. Or these days, there's uh, even like 
uh, some uh, models that went a step further and said uh, all intermediate representation should be words. There's uh, what is it? Uh, Sakura? Uh, is it Google or Facebook? Um, make, I'm blinking or open yeah. But yeah, they said, hey, let, my intermediate representation is going to be language. Um, and that's a human interpretable. Um, and, and so, so as you can imagine, there's a trade off. Like something that's human interpretable versus something that's really good performance, one robust, and all this. And we'll di discuss all of those trade offs. Um, and finally, when we think of reasoning, often we think of some kind of ex external knowledge, maybe some common sense uh, database or knowledge base, or some other knowledge about how, uh, how language is structured, how images are related to each other, for example. So, reasoning is very interesting. Um, a lot of uh, new work in that direction, I think. Um, so, and when we study it, we, we have to think about integrating the structure, but not just the explicit structure, which we will usually model, usually in the uh, second challenge when we learn the representation, because there's this explicit, uh, like language is a sequence. So I explicitly, uh, study, but there's also the latent structure, like language has a, a grammar to it or some image maybe could have some kind of structure into it. Uh, when we study it, uh, reasoning, we have to think of what those intermediate concepts would be like, like representation that are a little bit more dense, attention words, and also the inference paradigm. We, we always think of like feed-forward neural networks like as, as, as one way of, of doing inference, uh, but there are other approaches like causal or logical, and finally the external knowledge. How do you integrate or how do you discover external knowledge? So how do you discover or aggregate knowledge and how you integrate it as well? So that's the third one. The fourth one is generation. It's no more just integrating. So local representation, structured or alignment, alignment and then structural representation and reasoning. But now suddenly you're learning a generative process to produce raw modality that reflect the cross-modal interaction structure and the coherence between that. So we talk about like, like connections and, and cross-modal interaction. When you generate the data, you're kind of reverse engineering all of these connection and interactions as well. So there's at least three challenges there. And they are kind of related in the amount of information. So reduction, uh, where you're summarizing, so summarization. So you're generating either same modalities or new modality, but the amount of information is summarized. In typical translation, you want to maintain as much of your source in your target. And that's typical of machine translation. Machine translation, you want from one language to another, but keep most of the content, most of the intent, most of the semantic from one to another. And the, I would say the new one that's still like other underexplored and, and, and bring its own interesting challenges is creation. You, you start from a seed, you, you kind of have an initial idea and you want to generate, maybe you, um, you want to generate how your robot should talk or how your agent or virtual human should talk. And so that's creation as well. So the fifth one is transference. You remember earlier we talked about modulation, how one modality can modulate another modality. That's what it is. Transference is a transfer of knowledge between modality usually to help the target modality or the, what we would call the primary modality. And because this one may be noisy or have limited resources. So what it is, is that one of your primary modality or target modality was less resources or more noisy or something. And then this other modality will come in and bring and enrich that first modality. So there's at least three ways of doing this. One is what we call more like the typical or uh, more closer to transfer learning or similar or to transfer learning. It's like both, you learn models in both cases, both for your, and you, you could have one or multiple 
target of primary modality and those auxiliary modalities can come they learn something locally and then that knowledge is transferred between models or between representation but then there's the two concepts of co-learning co-learning via representation or co-learning via generation so here there's only one model and the model takes as input the primary modality and during training only during training we'll also take the auxiliary modality but only during training at test time this one will not be there and that's true here also the transfer is usually that this one at test time is only this this is only available at training uh and there is currently via generation where in this case you are uh, only one model but you are making it so that it generates the second auxiliary modality. So that's co learning. And the last one is quantification. Quantification here is very interesting because what it does is this empirical and theoretical study of heterogeneity, cross modal interaction, and multimodal learning. So everything we studied up to now. Uh, but really trying to understand, quantify, understand how things are happening. Because it's one thing to learn a representation and a multimodal representation and show on your downstream path that it performed well. But it's also another to try to see, but what really the cross modal interaction that happened really there. I think I, I built my model very highly nonlinear model, but is it really what's happening? Maybe just additive fusion or additive will have been sufficient and really understanding what is the impact of different heterogeneity like like is is spatial really different from temporal and is, is it really fundamentally we need to address them yeah? or are they just one a, a small uh, a, a, a just slightly general version of the other so and how is the learning process we, we will discuss that but in multimodal or in deep learning, um, uh, there are many hyperparameter. Uh, deep learning, we, we know that many hyperparameter, um, and some of them are very important for, for many examples, like learning rate may be important. But if you have multimodal case, should you use the same learning rate for each modality? Uh, should, should, should the fusion be at the same learning rate as each modality? So, so there's a lot of interesting thing as well. Uh, also, how do you learn in a way that is robust, that if you have missing data, uh, so the noise, everything we talked about earlier about the noise as well. So the summary is that multimodal at the core, almost every problem has local representation and alignment, and in fact, alignment also bring this uh, structured representation. These two to come together eventually to do reasoning. It could be shallow reasoning, like like some kind of a feed forward, or it could be a more human interpretable. Um, and sometimes this is your end goal. Just from reasoning, you go and it's your end goal. Or sometimes you use that to do a generation, or maybe you use that to transfer information. And at, at the end, sometimes you skip reasoning, and finally the quantification. So this is uh the the figure and that's what we will go over uh during the semester in fact uh we um spent quite a bit of time on the schedule it may change slightly but here's the schedule um so we are uh, talking about the course introduction today uh and uh, if i have time i will go and start talking about the syllabus uh, we will continue the syllabus uh on thursday um Thursday is a special uh, lecture because this course, one of the core important thing in this course is a course project. We generally want you to do fun research for this course, like really explore interesting new ideas. So we want you, instead of being course project, is this thing you do two days before the deadline at the end of the class? You've never done that, I'm sure. But yeah, some students do that. Uh, so here, you start your course project next week. Like you start really early on thinking about it and really building most of the assignment. Instead of giving you assignment on data sets you don't want to work on, all of the assignments 
in this class are all based on the data that you want to work on as a team, as a group. We'll give more details on that. Um, uh, since we all come from different fields, um, we will have some core and basic concepts, but this is like taking a full deep learning course and in one lecture. So we'll just really at a high level. And that's one question if like for this class, like, am I ready for this class? I mean, you should have taken some machine learning course before, either at CMU or somewhere else. And you should already have knowledge and some aspect of deep learning. At the minimum, you should be, for example, able to run PyTorch coral and, and build some from there. So if you're not sure about that, this course is given also in the spring and in the fall. So it's not like, and um, so it is, um, it is originally designed as a third semester course, this course, but more and more students are taking first semester where it was meant as a third or second semester. So, and then unimodal representation, that's also where we're gonna talk about heterogeneity, all the differences of different modalities. And then multimodal representation, looking at cross-modal interaction, fusion, coordination, and fission. And then looking at how do you align data and how you have uh, the transformer, so that transformer interaction and multi-model transformer. And then we start the reasoning, looking at memory model, hierarchical model, and reinforcement, but with the goal of looking at the multi-model facet of reinforcement learning, and then looking at low logical and causal inference. There's a fall break, which is a nice innovation this time. And so, and we're, we're, we are careful not to put a deadline the Sunday after the uh, fall break. So, um, so um, and then uh, generation, um, uh, and then there is the midterm presentation. This is fun for us. This is, I've been, we've been talking the whole time. And then this is, uh, everybody will talk about their research ideas for the project. By that point, you already done uh, 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 two assignments, the first assignment and the second assignment and the midterm. So you're three assignments into your project already by that time. So this is the due, like the midterm is due by Halloween, the day before Halloween. Um, so, so the project midterm, short presentation, what you want, and you're going to get feedback from all the other students as well. Uh, any paper you may have not picked up, any idea that you have, and then we talk about transference, multimodal co-learning, and then quantification. Here, the idea is really about how you model um, and, the, and visualize the data, visualize the interaction. And, and finally, this is also another fun one. We, with all the TAs, review the last year uh, and, and find like those like 10 to 15 papers like that are really interesting. And, and bring you, I mean, we integrate over the years, every over every semester, specifically this year, because it's a big revamp, but we go a step further, like really brand new. Um, uh, the Thanksgiving week, there's no classes. Um, the first half of it, where it's a good time to work on your project. Um, we have two, uh, where this one would be confirmed the exact topic, but this is about language and more applied aspect of it, so embodied and robot uh, and more multimodal application. And finally, the final presentations. The exact format will be decided, but it is really likely the midterm uh, presentations will be uh, with, um, uh, the midterm will be oral presentation and the final will be poster. And we, we are quite likely to, if, 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 if health restriction, everything works, we may invite uh, Bradley, the School of Computer Science, to attend uh, to show all your work. Don't worry, usually they, they're not mostly.